Good afternoon and welcome to today's session, The Future is Dynamic. My name is Leah Lewis, and before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes. Today we are using the Event EQ Hive platform. We wanted to provide a few tips on how to make the most of your experience today. Join the session chats to share your thoughts on the content and connect with your colleagues about the sessions you're attending. We also encourage you to visit the exhibitors link in the lobby to learn more about our partners who helped put this event together. Spend some time visiting our sponsors page in the exhibitor section to see how their support can enhance your experience. If you have any technical support questions, feel free to type your questions in the chat box or email capital at pcma.org for prompt assistance. If you have questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A function to type in your question. Look at the publish tab in the Q&A section to upvote questions that you have already been asked. The speaker will address questions at the end of the session. On-demand sessions are available after the conference 24 seven for your viewing pleasure for 90 days following the conference. So you'll be able to have access to the session and the other breakouts if you miss anything. Once the session ends, please join us back in the keynote room at 4.10 PM for a closing reception featuring the in interesting conversation game show. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Aisha Thomas. Aisha Thomas is a leadership and team development expert, consultant, author, and professional speaker. She coaches leaders and manages and managers to improve workplace culture, communication, engagement, and diversity. She has excelled in multiple leadership roles, managed numerous high-performing teams, and developed leaders from the first tier to executive levels. As a member of the United States Air Force, she has proudly served her country during peaceful and global peaceful times and global conflicts. Aisha is a multiple award winner for her professional and community service from Im improving organizational culture and practices while also developing managers, teams, and the next generation of leaders, today's youth. She has reached thousands nationwide and continues to transform multiple sectors and individuals one solution at a time. Please join me in welcoming Aisha Thomas. There we go. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing in there? I see you all in the chat. Good afternoon. I'm Aisha Thomas, your leadership and team development expert. And I am so honored to be here today to provide you this training. This session called The Future is Diverse. Diversity is something that is extremely important, um, something that's really going to expand and really help us industry leaders in so many different ways. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I have this quote that team members don't quit the organization. They typically quit the leader. And that's why you need leadership development. But I also talk about it from the aspect of diversity and how it benefits organizations, industries, how it benefits your clientele. So again, that's what we're going to talk about today. So thank you for joining me today. And also this is going to be interactive. So there are going to be portions of this where I'm going to ask questions and they'll be on the slides. Answer that in the chat. I want to interact with you. I want this to be a conversation. So answer that in the public chat area, not in the Q&A. That'll be towards the end, but in the public chat area, answer those questions. So let's get into it. So again, the focus is talking about the future is diverse. Four strategies to be a change agent. And with everything going on in the world, in the nation right now, it's so important that you take this information in because again, it's gonna benefit you in so many different ways. Okay, so let's talk about what the agenda is gonna be. So again, I talk about four strategies of being a change agent. So the first area is addressing biases. All of us, a lot of us have it, and it might be in different pockets, but a lot of us have different biases. So that's going to be the first area, because I believe as leaders, and I'm going to refer to you guys as leaders throughout this conversation, is that we have all, we have to check ourselves first, look within, address those biases, address those areas that are so important to, you know, kind of just look in the mirror a little bit, right? Um, the next area is a change agent goes below the surface. And that's really understanding our client, our industries, the people we act, interact with more than what's on the surface, because sometimes that's where those biases come from. We see someone from what we see on the outside and never take time to really look in the inside. Then we're going to talk about empathy, building relationships. And the last area is changing, making institutional change, really changing, depending on where you are. You might be a business leader. You might be an executive. You might be on different levels within what you do, but really creating that institutional change. So even in the future, as you progress, as you move about, you can make change and be that change agent within that institution and organization. 
All right. So what are our first chat questions? And again, answer this in the public chat area. What are one or two words that come to your mind when you hear diversity? When diversity comes to mind, what are those one or two words that pop in your head? So I'll give you guys a quick second and just pop that in the chat. Robin put a race. What else do we have? What else comes in your mind when you think about diversity? Um, what are those one or two words? Differences, equity, different ideas, inclusion. Yes, yes. So those are all different things. Like someone hears the word. And again, that's where we talk about that surface level language. Thank you, Robin. Different things will pop in your head when you think about the word diversity. United inclusion. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yes. Mm hmm. So again, and again, this goes into the surface level, but as we're going throughout this session, we're going to talk about and get a little bit more deeper. And then when you hear a word, when you hear a term, it's so much more to that. Okay. So the reason why I came up with this training is I did a corporate training with, um, with some leaders and we were talking about the shape of, I call them the future of the now, excuse me, the, the, the generation of the now and the generation of the future. And the reason why I talked about those parallels is we were talking about marketing and how to speak the language of the different generations. But when you got to the, uh, to the generation of the future and the leaders of the future, you're talking about your millennials. Data out there shows that millennials will basically be the scope of the workforce. And then following behind them are the Gen Zers. And we were talking about how do you communicate to them? How do you market to them? Because again, we're living in a social media age and a texting age and a technological age. So how do you speak to these different generations? Because most workspaces, most industries are very multi-generational. So how do you speak that language? So here we are, we have the millennials. These are the, the millennials on this side. When we think about the development of these individuals, they were the world events that kind of developed their mindset or the things they experienced were things like Columbine, 9-11, the internet. And what are they motivated by? They're motivated by unique experiences, flexibility, and diversity. And even with communication, communication is I am, text, email. I'm a millennial. Woo -woo. Shout out to all the millennials out there. And I know how to kind of, you know, utilize multiple um, aspects in communication. Now, who's following behind them to take over these industries and be the industry leaders? You're talking about Gen Z. Ah, Michael, I see you. Woo -woo. Okay, I see you, Robin. <laughs> Gen Zers. So within them, again, social media. And when I was talking about social media, this training, it was talking, it was to explain, okay, this is typically, they are social media a lot. This is the form of communication. This is a plat platforms that they utilize on a regular basis. But what world events are they currently experiencing that develop Gen Zers? Things like the Great Recession, uh, things like techno uh, technological expansions and things that happen. I mean, there's so many differences that were or different platforms that we're using now than those who remember dial up AOL. I remember you got mail, right? You log in, you hear that noise and you get excited when you hear you got mail because you got internet service. Yes, now I can get on. But things have changed so much by a click of the button. You're on Google and you can go to a website. And also things like COVID and also what's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, like the All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, all these different things that are happening. But again, they're motivated by what you see, diversity, personalization, individuality. And again, their communication needs are IMs, text, and social media. Why is this important? Because as industry leaders are, and leaders in our spaces, we need to be thinking about the future. One of my nicknames that my organization calls me is Big Picture. Because whenever I'm making a decision, whenever I am kind of formulating what I'm going to do on the strategic level, I always Always think about the future. How is this going to affect the airmen that we have in the Air Force? We call each other airmen. How is it going to affect our future airmen? How is it going to affect the organization? So that's the mindset that I want us to be in. We're going to talk about it from the client perspective, as well as the future leaders, industry leaders, the people that are going to have buying power. And again, leading the organization. One of the correlations between these two was diversity. They're looking for this in your branding. They're looking for this in your messaging. They're looking at this within your organization, even how they are are um, searching for jobs. They're looking for those spaces to be more diverse, inclusive, and equitable. So a lot of this information is going to benefit you from that lens, preparing for the future so we can connect with these individuals who are going to be, again, the future of our industries and the leadership. 
So I always like to, sh I always love to share um, statistics and data because again, I want us to look at it from the aspect of recruiting and retention and internally for those that are industry leaders or your leaders within organizations and also from the client perspective, why it's, why diversity is so important. So on the recruiting and retention side, the internal side, it says that nearly half of the workforce is employed by organizations that are creating safe and welcoming environments for their employee. So they're looking for places to be safe and welcoming. And that means, okay, are they going to embrace me? Do I have to show up and act and be different? Can I be who I'm, I am? I might want to see inclusion and equity. And then on the client side, a McKinsey report showed that companies in the top quartile for diversity were respectively 35 and 15% more likely to have financial returns. So on the client side, it's beneficial to have diversity because again, it's going to benefit you being an industry leader to continue on that path and also the returns that you have. So again, I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of internally, but this also applies to our clients because if we don't consider what the client needs are for the future, then we aren't going to be the future of our organizations are going to push ahead in the future. We're going to see organizations and other industries passing us because we're not being innovative. So think about innovations as, as we're talking about this. So what are the benefits of inclusion and equity? So the first area, you heard me mention it just now, innovation. So this here says a Boston consulting group, they did a study and they discovered com companies with more diverse management teams had 90% points higher innovation revenues than companies below average diversity scores, um, excuse me, scores. Why? It's because diverse rooms allows you to maybe get perspectives of an industry or a client that you might not know of. Listen, I'm a mother. So say you're marketing to moms and maybe you have a mom in the group, a woman in that group. Now she can speak to that audience. Maybe you are trying to market to the African-American community or the Hispanic community. You have someone in there that can say, no, we like this. We don't like this. So really think about innovation. You have diverse mindsets, backgrounds, talents can, that can really give you innovative tools and information that's going to benefit you again, becoming that industry leader, continue on that path. The other area is revenue, the dollar dollar bill. Diverse companies enjoy 23, I mean, yeah, 23 higher cash flow per employee, 20 Three, okay, revenue is so important for our industries again to push ahead. More clients, diverse companies are much more likely to capture new markets, like I mentioned earlier. By you having those diverse individuals in the room, you can connect with more people and they feel included and safe. And then long lasting, diverse companies are as much as 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. So in order to, uh, to outperform your competitors, you want to consider that aspect as well. So again, continue to think about those are the benefits. Now, I want to kind of dive deeper because when I really started to research what each area means, because again, I serve in the military. So I was able to, and I'm West African. So coming to the United States, I got to, I had a totally different experience. When I joined the military, I had a different experience because I was around all these different diverse people from diverse backgrounds. So when you're thinking about diversity, you're thinking about protected areas, race, gender, religion, sexual preference, a space that mimics the face of society. So those think about it as the faces. And now inclusion now on the side of inclusion, those are the behaviors where all are treated fairly and are accepted. Hey, I want your input. What do you feel about this? Opening those doors and getting that input from those diverse faces in your organization, in those industries, in your clients. And then also equity is now providing equal access to opportunities and resources. I call, I call that, now that you're opening the door, now I can have a seat. So it's one thing to open the door, you hear my voice, but now equity is now I have a seat at the table. So those are the differences with each area. So a lot of us will hear the word diversity, but really, what a lot of industries are needing is that area of inclusion and that area of equity. Those are the important areas that we really want to focus on as well. So those are the difference between the three. We really want to be more inclusive and we definitely want to be more equitable. OK, so, of course, when we're thinking about diversity, inclusion and equity, we're thinking about different areas. So some other areas to consider, again, like I mentioned earlier, race gender, sexual, sexual orientation, age, generational. That part is so important because a lot of people don't recognize or understand how to speak to the different generations. They don't understand what the Gen Z is like. Why are you guys 
the retention rate is so hard. Like it, 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 those individuals seem to move on so quickly. But again, it's speaking that language and understanding them instead of devalue, devaluing them. And also the disability aspect. There are people, again, that are being judged or there's some um, biases that are happening where individuals aren't getting seats at the table because of these assumptions. So those are the things we want to consider when we're thinking about D, E, and I. There are a variety of areas that need focus, and these are the top areas here. So one of the things that I want to talk about first is talking about unconscious bias and how that stereotype can turn into a bias that can turn into discriminatory action. And it's so important that, again, we check ourselves because we might just like I said, the name diversity, two names, like two words might have popped in your head. You might have had something that came to your mind, a word came to your mind. But now it's going a little deeper and having a deeper understanding of that. So stereotype, those are those widely held, but fixed and oversimplified images or ideas of a particular type of person or a thing. So stereotypes are things that we learn from our first teachers, our parents, maybe friends, and also media. There's so much information that we're being fed. Again, I say I'm West African. I learned a lot about America from watching TV. But all that information wasn't accurate. I didn't really truly learn about these different individuals or these different locations until I actually went there. So that's a stereotype. But if that's not addressed, look at how we can transition. Now it's turned into an unconscious bias. Those are those stereotypes that are automatic, um, excuse me, unconscious bias are those stereotypes or automatic associations formed outside of conscious awareness. So you're not even aware that it's happening and it's beyond your control. And now it's influencing your behavior. And from this, it says, this is the biggest predictor of our behaviors. And it's so important that you recognize that. And thank you, Leah, there is a handout in um, that you can download and it has this information on there so you can be aware of how this flows. So now it goes from your unconscious bias. You're not aware of it. Now it's affecting your behavior and now you're making judgments and assumptions, right? I choose them over them. I'd rather eat here than this. Who has biases about where they eat? I love Chipotle, y'all. So I'll eat at Chipotle. I won't go anywhere else, all right? <laughs> so it's the same kind of food. So we even have biases in um, the different like foods that we choose. But remember, we want to think about it now. It's reflect, uh, it can affect our behaviors. And now it can transition. Yes, Robin, not too many onions or cilantro. Then it turns into discriminatory action. So if these leave unchecked, now it's turned into a discriminatory action and now your behaviors, now you might be disciplining, disciplining these individuals differently. It can lead to a lack of inclusion. And now because of this, now it's turned into a cycle because it left unchecked. So it's so important that we start to check each area so it doesn't cycle from here to here because regardless of what, what we watch or who we might be around, they might have stereotypes. But how can we as leaders be change agents to check our own biases and make sure that we're not falling into the trap? So the first thing is when it comes to stereotypes, are you aware of what is feeding your bias for unconscious bias? How does it affect your bias? How does it affect how you act externally? And again, it's having that self-awareness. How are you now showing up because the stereotype and has this unconscious bias that's now being fueled? And now how is it affecting your behavior? Could your behavior be affecting an individual or others of certain groups? Now you're not reaching certain clients. Now you're not bringing, you're not connecting with people you work next to. And now what has been the result of negative behaviors to that person or group? That's a discriminatory action. What could potentially happen? So what could be the negative outcome? Because we've seen when discriminatory um, actions happen, it can shut down entire, uh, entire industries, businesses, organizations. So we need to start the process of checking our stereotypes first so it doesn't evolve into a discriminatory action. So you really want to focus on that. And again, that's in the handout for you to really start assessing and becoming more self-aware of us first so we can show up as effective change agents. So the next question, again, put that in the chat. In the public chat area, what has been your main bias source? Has it been media? Has it been maybe some circles you have been around? Maybe it's been friends. I know for me, it's been media. Again, I grew up and I learned so much about the United States from TV that was not accurate. So media has been one of the main sources, television, of uh, feeding those biases that I have. So really reflect on that media, family. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Robin. Thinking about all those experiences. So biases can be fueled by so many different things. And that's why it's important for you to reflect on that and identify what should you excuse me, what you should be consuming less of and what you should be consuming more of so you can really dispel those biases so it doesn't uh, turn into discriminatory behavior. 
Now the Facebook, yes, where I grew up. Thank you, Melissa. Location where I grew up, yes. All those different things can affect how you show up. Now the next area is, is again, go, get into the surface. So there's a prejudgment area. So what happened is on um, the University of Toronto, they did something where they sent out fake resumes. And what they did is that for a lot of the black participants or applicants, they, what they said, whitened their names. And then for some, they left the same, the names as the same. And what they recognized is the black and the names that were changed or whitened, they actually got more responses than those that did not change their names. And how this, so again, this is how it affects internally, externally, this can be a costly mistake. And now you're discounting prospective customers. Now you're not connecting to a certain customer or client because you have assumptions that, hey, this person won't purchase. I was listening to a podcast yesterday and this person had mentioned to a potential client, hey, I wanted to give you the cheaper option. And they're like, why, why did they think that I needed the cheaper option? Tell, tell me the best product that you have because I can't afford it. So just imagine how prejudgment, again, with how you lead your team, how you connect within um, your organizations, your businesses, and your, again, your team, and how it also can affect your clientele. Though that's how it can affect both areas. So it's so important that we're looking deeper than what we see on the outside. So we've all seen maybe this picture of this iceberg. So the top area are those surface level things, right? Someone mentioned, Robin mentioned Facebook in the chat. So did Michael, fake book, ah, love it, fake book. So you mentioned that, right? So from the outside, say you have a potential candidate that wants to come and work next to you, but you go on their site and you're learning all these different things about them, but it's just surface level. You haven't even had a conversation with the person. But if you did below the surface, you start to hear about their values, experiences, for those clients, you start to learn about them and they're like, ah, they can't afford my services. Education, work style. There's so many things deeper than what is on the surface that is so important that we are looking deeper. So I put here, look below the surface. What are you missing out on by assumptions made from the surface? What clients, partnerships, and team talents are you missing out on by you looking solely on the surface? Think about those resumes. They look, they canceled out people solely by their name. They didn't think about what about their experience? What about their background, their education? So it's so important that you recognize that. Um, Cheryl says, I remember reading that study. It was powerful. Mary said, I worked in retail in high school, college, learned early that judging a customer by how they are dressed does not help you make sales. I've heard of billionaires that dress, I guess what you would consider really normal, and they show up places and you will never know they have I guess what you consider regular cars, they're not in no fancy Bentley and people assume and judge and they don't realize that they are very wealthy or they can afford those services. So what are you missing out on by not looking below the surface? Take time and get to know individuals deeper than what you're seeing externally. So really think about that. Has surface information created surface assumptions in your mind? I know that I've seen people dress a certain way and I'm like, okay, uh, you just have all these thoughts in your head. What were those assumptions? Um, Mary said, better dress generally, do, do not spend more. Ah, see? <laughs> Melissa also said in recovering from COVID, it will be easy as supplier to assume clients do not have the budget and that can limit our partnership. Exactly. So think about the assumptions that we're making just because something is happening or you're thinking, oh, COVID is happening. No one wants to spend. So you don't reach out. My business has thrived more in COVID than any other time. So just imagine the assumptions that could be affecting you connecting with individuals. All right. So again, really reflect on that and consider what you could be missing out on. Now we're going to talk about empathy and building relationships. This one area says that empathy is the number one rule for new product innovation. So think about it in this way. When you can understand the client's needs, what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with, you can empathize and you can create a product or an experience that caters to them because you understand what they're dealing with. And now you're a problem solver because you understand that. And also building relationships, it says 54% of employees say a strong sense of community, great coworkers, celebrating milestone, a common mission kept them at a company longer. So empathy and building relationships are so important because you not only understand client, customers, team member, you also can build relationships with them and keep that relationship and that partnership Hang, um, um, excuse me, that partnership longer because you've done that. So what does that look like? 
So let's talk about what empathy is, right? That's understanding the feelings of others, ability to put yourself in the shoes of others. So even again, with what's going on right now, there might be some individuals that don't understand, but what are you doing to make sure you're listening to different backgrounds? What are you doing to learn from different backgrounds? Again, that media or those different items that you're consuming might not be giving you actual and factual information. So what can you do to learn from different backgrounds? And one of the areas that's so important is volunteerism. Volunteerism has allowed me to get connected with people I wouldn't connect with on a regular basis. You're hearing stories from that uh, individual that might be homeless and you're going to that shelter to help feed, feed, um, feed them and you're starting to understand, oh, you're homeless because of the hurricane or this is what happened. But if I saw them walking down the street, I wouldn't even know their story. So what are you incorporating in your business practices? What are you doing to get around different backgrounds so you can listen and learn? And then building relationships. Again, that's the ability to identify and initiate working relationships and to develop and maintain them for mutual benefit. So again, is your circle diverse? What are you doing? Again, I'm blessed to serve and I'm around a diverse group of people all the time, but how often are you getting around different groups? Is your workplace diverse and inclusive? Sometimes that's the, that's the most diversiveness, or excuse me, diversity that you're gonna see is in the workplace, but are you connecting with other team members? Who can you connect with that is different from you than the norm? So these are things that are so important because, again, as you're developing empathy, understanding different stories, you're building relationships. Now, again, you're understanding how to serve your industry more and connect with your team members more. So it's so important that you are doing that on a regular basis, developing empathy and also working on building relationships because both of those areas are super important. All right. So now, again, when we talk about the reflection be before we go to the last area, do you think it's easier to sympathize? So when you can relate to someone, is it easier to sympathize or is it easier for you to empathize if it's unrelated? I can say it's easier for me to sympathize. When I've been through it, I'm like, oh, I get it. I'm a mom too. Right now, my son will barge in the room and say, mommy. And I'm like, I get it. Or you might not really understand because there was a time where I wasn't a parent and I just didn't understand. John said, this is the foundation of events in our industry. Events build relationships. They enable exposure and learning from people and cultures we do not experience every day. So critical. Yes, John, where you are today. Who are you going to connect with? Who are you going to network with? When you log off, don't just leave. Go in the rooms and connect with new people. Market, reach out to them, connect with them on LinkedIn, get to know them. Sympathize. Yes, yeah, sympathize. A lot of times it's so much easier to sympathize, but what we need to do is work on empathy. Now let's transition into the last area. Your company externally, right? Again, I talk about how this can affect you externally and internally. 67% of candidates seek out a diverse companies. And internally, 78% of employees believe DNI is a competitive advantage. 39% says it's a significant advantage. And we talked about that earlier. So again, externally, people are paying attention to what your industry is doing or what you're doing as a leader. And internally, people are paying attention and noticing that it's a competitive advantage. So let's talk about that. One of the case studies I want to talk about is the CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benioff. In 2012, he noticed that there was a lack of women representation in his um, meetings. So what he did, he opened the door of inclusion and he says that 30% of his meetings have to have women in there, 30%. So he set that standard in 2012. And, all, and even though they had um, the best places to work, they had all these awards. In 2015, two of his female executives told him, hey, there's a major pay gap a major pay gap. And he said in his book how offended he was, but essentially what did Mark Benioff do? He started to do research. He started to find out and he did a salary review of the 17K um, employees that he had. He created a team and what did he identify? There was a pay gap. And he ended up investing money to make that change. Okay. And then in 2017, he even realized he had an unconscious bias when he was interacting with the woman within, um, they were having a, um, um, it was an event that they were having and they were having different speakers. And his wife noticed that for the males that came off, he shook their hand before the female, he gave her a hug. And he, she was like, well, they want to be treated professionally as well. Why did you act differently in this case? And he was like, I didn't even think about that. So he launched a co-aid mentoring program and training that training program from that. 
So it's so important that we're recognizing that, yes, your team members or individuals can come to you and say, hey, we're noticing that there is this issue, but what solutions are you going to make? So what did he do? He hired a chief equality officer. He created affinity groups, AKA ERGs. Um, he started to come up with, with gender strategies, addressing the pay gap. So he invested $6 million to address the pay gap. Um, he um, incorporated education and training promotions. Even in 2020, his chief equality officer started to focus on recruiting strategies. Even in research and PCMA, their CEO has that statement, that messaging out there that says diversity and inclusion is important. So we're gonna do our work to provide the training and connect with diverse people from diverse backgrounds. So it's important that we're doing that. And I know we're towards the end here, but what are some things you can do to create institutional change? And Cheryl, yes, that story was powerful. Keep sharing in the chat. It's so important because, again, this helps with people understanding and empathizing. So thank you for being so open and vulnerable. So, again, it's that employee and leadership feedback and that client feedback. That's finding out what their needs are, their experiences. Do that internal audit. Verify the information. You might hear things are happening, but what can you do to verify that information? Once you do that internal audit as well and identify it next is developing the team and really asking okay let's develop a team of a team that's going to be able to create to able to address this issue um, and consider who will help in executing this mission to fix the issue to find best actions of um, excuse me best plans of actions budget reviews create new plans and programs and also once you've done that create a maintenance plan so yes, it was addressed in this season, but as you saw before with Mark Benioff, he didn't stop there. He started to continue to evolve. Even in 2020, they noticed that in 2020, there was a gap in recruiting. We know recruiting has biases. Oh, maybe these individuals are only going to hire this or, or recruit or, um, excuse me, refer these individuals. Oh, okay, if we recruit from these elite universities, hey, it might only be this one racial group. So it's something that you want to continue to maintain and identify as you go. Robin says, when I work with an international nonprofit, I help some people in Bangladesh get access to a meeting in Rio. When they met me in person, they brought me a shirt and a tie as a gift because they thought I was a male. <laughs> wow. Yes. So again, those assumptions, right? So again, that's what you can do for institutional change. So as we wrap up and we get some Q&A questions, what is one strategy you think you can implement within the next 30 days to become a change agent? Are you going to say, I'm going to start being more aware of what I'm watching? Maybe I'm going to expand my knowledge and read a book that from someone that I might not even think to read about, right? Maybe, um, maybe what I'm going to do is start having a lunch with maybe a team member that I have not connected with because, again, we have our cliques at work. We have those people that we will only connect with. So what are you going to do? What kind of differences, I mean, excuse me, changes? And if you're a leader listening to this, what kind of changes or what kind of things can you start addressing and creating within your organization or institution so you can make sure that your clients of different backgrounds are being heard and your team members of different backgrounds are being heard? So think and reflect on that. What is one strategy you can implement within the next 30 days to become that change agent? So again, we talked about addressing bias, really focusing on ourselves. What kind of biases do we have that's affecting how we're interacting with clients and team members? And even again, within our industries, what can you do to start going below the surface? Yes, I see you, but do I see you internally? Am I really taking time to get to know people below the surface? The next thing is empathy and relationship building is how you're going to understand your clients, your industry, your team members, because now if you understand them, you can serve them effectively. And then also being that change agent by creating institutional change, because by you doing each one of these, now you can create change because you're hearing the stories from different people and now you can make change. Robin said, it's so important to remember that what you said early in the presentation, just because your organization meeting group may look diverse, it doesn't mean they're inclusive and equitable. That is so powerful. Thank you for that. Um, Jessica says, so true. Um, Mary says, a group I am a part of has started a reading list that we will all contribute to. I love that. It started as we are discussing anti-racism and has evolved to learn about new authors and, and genres that we may not have explored before. Thank you for doing that, Mary. I think that is a great idea. All right. And Will said, continue to read from different voices. Thank you all for that. So again, we'll transition to the Q&A portion. I really thank you guys for sharing, for being a part of this conversation. Um, and we'll get into these questions and answers um, so I can support you guys in that area. Okay. Let's see. 
Joyce said, based on the information you shared regarding hiring and looking at the names of candidates, would you recommend blind resume reviews where the name isn't shared uh, in the initial review? I will. I would. Are there pros and cons to keep in mind? No, not at all. Because again, you're been moving and there was a study um, and I'll see if I can share that um, later. But there was a study that found that I, I believe it was like a, a orchestra or um, they were having music auditions. So what they did is they, they created a curtain and they had different people play behind the curtain. And what happened is that they ended up bringing on a lot more women than males because prior to they noticed that they had that lack of inclusion in there so yes uh, even again i serve in the united states air force i'm a part of their um, inclusion and diversity teams and that's one of the aspects they're going to do because a lot of us have to submit a picture with our summer awards packages and again, our names can sometimes, again, some people have names and people are prejudged by that. So they're removing those two areas and what they're looking at solely at experience and background. So yes, I think there are more pros and cons because again, you want to still make sure the person has the skills and the abilities and the knowledge that they have, um, that they need to execute the job. And also recognizing when you're recruiting and when you're putting out job ads, really look and identify what are the responsibilities? What are the needs of that role to make sure that even in your job ads and how you're recruiting, there isn't some biases within the language and biases within the thought process. So there are a lot more pros and cons if you're still focused on the skills and the abilities. And Mary asks, what are some ideas of getting an organization from diverse to inclusive, um, um, inclusive and equitable? Of course, identify the issue, just like I broke down on the slide earlier. You want to identify the issue. You want to do that process I highlighted where you're identifying what the issue is and really making sure that you're showing, okay, this is what we're seeing. There is a pay gap. So when Mark Benioff met with his um, women executives, that's what he did. He identified an audit. So go to your website, look in the different um, teams um, and the organizations, because um, even with us, we have divisions within. And start to identify, I'm trying to find the slide so I can bring it up, and start to identify where are their gaps. Are there pay gaps? And start um, and maybe being the person that say, hey, I want to create a team and really identify if there are some um, lack of inclusion in certain areas. Because a lot of times what you're seeing a lack of inclusion is when you're going from the uh, first and mid tier level of leadership to the executive level. There's a big gap in um, inclusion and equity there. So please make sure that you're taking time and doing this process. Get feedback, right? Because whenever you whenever you want to go to your, your leadership or your organization about it, get the feedback, get the data, do the audit, and then you can present it to them and they can say, okay, well now how about you lead a team or help me create a team? Or maybe you know someone else is more um, that might be able to assist in that area. And now they can start to come up with strategies, really get to the weeds of it, even if that means hiring externally, so they can start to identify identify if that's that is a fact and if so what kind of plans of actions and again mark benioff i love reading his book i love researching him because he is someone that was able to in, to change his institutional from the top to bottom and these changes didn't happen overnight it took time so it took a few years for the pay gap to be closed it took a few years for certain things to happen and again even in 2020 he's identified that there's still some issues and some areas that need to be addressed so again i can assure you that it's still going to take time for certain areas to be addressed but again it's just starting with getting the data the statistics presenting it and then also being okay or getting a team around it to help really create that change so yes that could really be something that's beneficial um if you you know again get that information in that background um michael said actively seeking out information and education for people and groups different than myself to work on understanding what they're experiencing and how they're perceiving different events awesome so let me see if there are any other questions um, in the chat. And again, please download that um, question, excuse me, not a question of the handout. It really talks about the unconscious bias because again, in order for us to be change agents, we have to make sure that we are checking ourselves, identifying our biases because it might be affecting us with our client relationships, within our teams, and also might affecting, affecting how we're treating others where we're now focused on the area of inclusivity and being more equitable. So. Um, I don't see any more questions. So again, I really appreciate you guys tuning in today. I'm um, being a part of this conversation and being open to become a change agent. And again, if you have any questions or concerns for me, you can reach out to me at info at aishathomas.org or on social media. But again, I appreciate you guys hopping in um, and getting this information and let's go out there and become better uh, with our change 
and are really incorporating inclusivity and equi equi excuse me, inclusivity and being more equitable in our organizations and our practices. Thank you. Aisha, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. We appreciate your time. And um, for our uh, Capital Chapter audience here, we are focusing our fourth quarter spark on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So look for more details from us on a spark event all about diversity at, um, in addition to our diversity and equity uh, mission on the website. Thank you. And uh, we will see you guys all in the back in the um, back in the general session for our closing reception at 410. So take a little break, get some coffee, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>